Okay, so next we're going to talk about regressions and how we visualize regressions. Um, and to start with, we need to do a quick basic review of how regression works, mostly so that we can then learn how to do the fancier multiple regression visualizations. Um, and so with regressions, all regression really is is it's drawing lines around dots. Um, and so here we have car displacement again and highway miles per gallon. So you can see that as displacement goes up, um, displacement means engine weight. I looked this up. Um, the heavier the car is, the, the worse mileage it gets, which makes sense. And so if you look at this line here, you can see that it's going down. Um, this line is also known as the best fit line. The way that you decide that it is the best fit is through um, lots of different methods. Um, there are non-parametric methods, for instance, that just look at kind of a narrow window of points and then choose the average in that window and then move down. And so you get like curvy lines that fit. Um, this is a best fit linear line. And the way this fits is it minimizes the distance between each of these dots and the line, or minimizes the squared distance, because statisticians don't like these negative numbers here. And so what you do, what the computer does, is it finds a point, um, it draws a line down to, or a smaller line down to this line, calculates that distance, and then determines if, uh, and then does that for every single point, and determines if that is the smallest number possible. And so if you can get the smallest sum of the squared distances, that's going to be your best fit line. So that's what this looks like in practice. Um, you have some dots that are really far away from the line, but you also have some dots that are like right on top of the line. So that's a good fit. That's a bad fit. But if you move this line any other way, um, it would get closer here, but it would also get further away from other points. And so you won't get as good of a fit. So that's, that's all that's happening with regression is you're just trying to fit a line in a good way. Um, because of this, um, lines um, have mathematical formulas that you can manipulate. Um, if you remember back in eighth grade when you covered um, how to draw lines, you hopefully learned this formula here, this y equals mx plus b, um, that has specific components in this equation that tell you how to draw a line. So y and x are numbers. Um, this m is the slope of the line. And that's defined as the rise over run. And so if the slope is like 1 over 2, that means in your actual graph, you go up 1 over 2, and then up 1 and over 2 again. And that's how you get the slope. And the B here is the y-intercept. That's where your line starts. And then you start using the slope to draw out the line. So some examples of this, is like this plot here, this shows y equals 2x minus 1. So the x inter or the y-intercept is negative 1. So it starts at negative 1. And then the slope is 2. So that means it's going up two over one, up two over one, up two over one, etc. And so that's that's how you draw a simple line. We can also draw a line like this. This is negative 0.5 is the slope. So that means down one over two, and it starts at six. So at six, we go down one over two, down one over two, and then we have a line. So that is how you. That's like basic geometry and algebra and how you draw lines. Um, this is important because in statistics and regression models, you do exactly the same thing. Instead of using y equals mx plus b, you use this fun formula, which is y hat equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus epsilon. Um, this maps on to the y equals mx plus b formula pretty exactly. Um, your y here, this y hat means predicted y. It's your outcome variable. It's your dependent variable. It's the thing that you're trying to explain. So if we're trying to say, does humidity influence high temperatures, high temperatures is going to be the outcome that we care about. It's our dependent variable. The x1 here is our explanatory variable or our independent variable. So if we're saying, does humidity influence temperatures, humi or humidity is the explanatory variable. It's the thing we're saying, as that moves up, does something happen to our outcome? Um, instead of using m and b, we use these beta coefficients here. So beta 1 is the coefficient in front of the explanatory variable. That's the slope for the explanatory variable. And beta 0 is the y-intercept. And for whatever reason, they typic statisticians typically put this first. Um, in y equals mx plus b land, the intercept comes at the end. Um, but you could also write this as 6 plus or 6 minus 0.5x. It's exactly the same thing algebraically. Um, statisticians like to put the intercept first, and then they put the other coefficients after. Importantly, you have this fun little letter here, which is epsilon in Greek. 
and it stands for the error. It's what you can't explain um, using this formula. And that's why you have this y hat. We're not perfectly explaining um, high temperatures per, during the day or miles per gallon in a car. We're explaining part of it using um, displacement or if we're talking about temperatures, we're using humidity, humidity to explain temperatures. That's getting a part of it, but there's also this epsilon part that we're not explaining and it's just kind of the residual part that we can't actually fully explain with our model. And so that's always included in these equations is to, just to show this is not perfect. There are errors, we're missing stuff and that's fine. Um, the way you do models in R, um, again, this isn't the focus of the class. The focus is using ggplot. Um, but today we're using ggplot to plot models, and so you need a quick, brief introduction to how to make models in R. Um, the function you use for a standard linear model is LM, which stands for linear model. Um, and the syntax you use is you use this, this tilde sign here. That's R's way of using a formula. And so you type essentially Y tilde, and then you put your Xs. If you just have one X, like humidity, you just, so it would be temperature high is explained by humidity or equals humidity. If you want to put multiple variables in there, you'd say um, temperature high is explained by humidity plus moon phase plus um, precipitation plus whatever. Like you can put all the variables you want to use and then you tell it what data set to look at. You say data equals name of the data set. Um, you typically save this as an object. So in this case, we'll just make something called name of model and then you can do stuff to it. And so if you run this, this function called summary name of model, it will show all of the coefficients. Um, it'll have output that kind of looks like stata. It'll have the p-values and the standard errors and the coefficients and a whole bunch of other diagnostic information um, just as a giant block of text. Um, if you don't use summary, there's this fun package called broom, which is part of the tidyverse, but it's not loaded when you, in, when you say library tidyverse, you have to load it separately. What this does is it takes these models and converts them into data frames that you can then use stuff like filter or mutate on. You can then plot. If you just do summary, you'll get a huge wall of text with all of the details, but you can't really extract single numbers from that wall of text. And it, you can, it's just really hard to do. Um, with Broom, if you use this function called tidy, it will convert the model results into a data frame with all of the coefficients and p-values and confidence intervals and everything as columns. If you use glance, it will convert all of the diagnostics, so like R squared and the AIC and the, the F statistic and a whole bunch of other like regular model statistics also into a data frame that you can then select specific columns or filter or summarize or do whatever you want with. Um, and so generally, it's better to use these types of functions to see what's, what the model results are because it's a lot cleaner. It's just tables and you can manipulate these things. If you just do summary, all you're gonna see is text and it's hard to manipulate. So let's show an example of how to do this. So we want to model the relationship between displacement and highway miles per gallon. So in stats language, we'll say highway hat, so predicted highway miles per gallon equals beta zero plus beta one displacement plus error. Um, the way we do this in R is we'll make a new object called car model. And this is going to be a linear model where we take highway is explained by displacement. And we're gonna use the miles per gallon data set. So right here, that's all we have to do to write a, or to build a model in R. If we wanna see the results of the model, this is where we can use tidy. So we're gonna take that car model that we made before and tidy it. And well, there's an argument here for confidence intervals and it will, if we set it to be true, by default it's false, but we can say conf int equals true. And then we'll get columns that show the confidence intervals. And so we can see the results here. We have an intercept of 35, so that's our beta zero. And then we have uh, the displacement coefficient is negative 3.5 and that's the, that's the beta one, the coefficient for displacement. And we'll talk about how to interpret these really quick in a slide or two. Um, if you use glance, this is where it shows the, the different model diagnostics like R squared and the F statistic and the p-value and AIC and BIC. So if you want to measure how well the model fits, that's, that's how you get, get that information. Um, using this information, information from Tidy though, we can translate the results to a mathematical formula. Um, so if we remember, 
that that y equals mx plus b formula or the beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 formula we can plug those things in so we know our beta coefficient or beta 0 is 35 so we can say predicted highway equals 35.7 and then that's going to be plus beta 1 times x1 and beta 1 here is this negative 3.5 and so that is kind of our magic formula for predicting highway miles per gallon and the nice thing about this is if we say there's a car out in the world that has a displacement of four, what do we think its miles per gallon is going to be? We can just plug in that number. We can say negative 3.5 times four is something, negative 15-ish. And then minus, or so 35.7 minus 15, that's going to be 20. Totally guessing. I could probably look at the chart here um, because it shows the same thing. So we're going to guess 20 miles per gallon on the highway. If we look at the plot here, I said four. Um, so that would be right here, about 22. Cool, I was close. Um, so this, this shows the predicted highway miles per gallon for every possible displacement. Um, if you notice, this works just like the y equals mx plus b situation. This is our y-intercept. So it starts at 35. Um, I extended the axis down here at the bottom so it starts at zero. So you can see if you extend this up all the way, it's going to start at 35. And then it's going to go down three and a half over one, and then down three and a half over one. So every time it's going down, that's the slope. It's, it's down three and a half over one, down three and a half over one. Um, the way we interpret this is you can use that slope to talk about the effect of displacement on miles per gallon. And you can actually use a sentence to do this. You say a one unit increase in x is associated with a beta 1 increase or decrease in y on average. So in this case, we can say a one unit increase in displacement, so moving from 4 to 5 or from 5 to 6, is associated with 3.5 um, lower miles per gallon on average. So every time you increase displacement by 1, your miles per gallon goes down by 3.5. And, and so that's the relationship that we're talking about. The nice thing about this is it's easy to visualize. That's just a line. Um, we visualized it right here. There's the relationship. Um, as displacement goes up, highway miles per gallon goes down. That's easy. Um, and so if you want to visualize the relationship between two variables, do a scatter plot, add a geom smooth to get a line on there, and you're good. Um, and so that, that's easy. But in real life, you're mostly not going to do single regression like that with one variable because you can actually control for a whole bunch of variables. You can throw in lots of explanatory variables. So instead of just doing beta 1 x1, you can do beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta whatever x whatever. You can include as many variables as you want in a model. Um, doing that in R is fairly easy. You just separate all of the different explanatory variables with a plus. And so here we're going to explain highway miles per gallon with displacement and cylinders and drive, meaning four wheel drive or front wheel drive or rear wheel drive using the MPG data set. And so here's our math equation. It's predicted highway miles per gallon equals beta zero plus beta one displacement plus beta two cycle plus beta three front wheel drive and beta four rear wheel drive. And if you notice, if you're familiar with regression, there's no four wheel drive here. That's because that's the base case. Um, if these are, if drive, if it's not front wheel drive and it's not rear wheel drive, then by default it's going to be four wheel drive, and that's just because four wheel drive is first alphabetically. There are ways in R to switch what what is the base case. Mathematically, it doesn't matter. It's still going to give the same results. It's just one will be omitted instead of the other. Um, and so, if we do a model like this with a whole bunch of explanatory variables, this is what the results look like. So we still have our intercept. But now we have slopes for each of these variables. We have a slope for displacement. We have a slope for cylinders. We have a slope for front wheel drive and a slope for rear wheel drive. And so we can put this into a our fancy equation here. And we can still predict highway miles per gallon. If we know that the displacement in a car is four, that it has six cylinders, that it is front wheel drive and not rear wheel drive, then what we do is we say 33.1 plus however many, negative 1 times whatever the displacement is, plus negative 1.45 times however many cylinders there are, plus 5, because it is this is set to 1 if it's front wheel drive, and then this is 0. So that is our predicted highway miles per gallon. Um, 
if we're interpreting these coefficients just by themselves, though, if we're not trying to predict things, and we're just saying, what is the effect of displacement on miles per gallon after we've controlled for these other things, that's where it gets a little bit trickier because we have all of these different moving parts here. So the best analogy I've found for explaining um, the effect of single coefficients when you have all of these different moving parts is this analogy here. Um, these are two different versions of a thing that makes lights change. Um, you have a switch that's a binary thing that it's either on or off, and then you have a slider that is a more continuous thing. And so you can move this thing up and down, and the light responds accordingly. The light responds to both of these things. This, the light responds just by turning on or off if it's this switch, um, and the light gets brighter or dimmer if you use the slider switch. And so if we apply this to regression, what we have are when we're dealing with categorical variables like drive, that's going to be a, a switch. And so if your car is front wheel drive instead of four wheel drive, then suddenly you got five more miles per gallon. Um, with the continuous variable, that means as you're moving displacement up by one or moving it down by one, something happens to miles per gallon. Um, and so that's how you can kind of interpret these different things. And so if you have a continuous variable like displacement or cylinders, then it's a slider. So what you can do is you say, holding everything else constant, not touching any of the other switches in the model, all you're doing is moving that one slider for displacement. So as you move the displacement slider up, um, miles per gallon goes down by negative 1.12. And so everything else is the same, and you're just moving that one slider. And so as displacement goes up, your miles per gallon gets worse. You can do the same thing with uh, cylinders here, where on average, as you increase the number of cylinders and leave everything else the same, so you move cylinders from four to five or from five to six, you're sliding that up. Um, the result that you get is that there are, you'll get negative um, 1.45 lower miles per gallon every time you move that slider up. Um, and so that's what that is showing. With categorical variables, that's our um, drive down here. So this is the switch. And so what you, the way you interpret this is you say, holding everything constant, so not moving the displacement switch, not moving the cylinder switch, um, you're just saying if the car is a, front, uh, is a front wheel drive car, then it will have five more miles per gallon for its mileage on average, um, because it's that 5.04. If we just move the rear wheel drive switch up, then it's going to have 4.89 more miles per gallon. And so what we can do when we're interpreting this is we just manipulate each of these switches or sliders. Um, if it's a categorical thing, we're just saying it's rear or it's not. It's front or it's not. Um, with the cylinders and displacement, we're saying we're moving displacement up a notch, we're moving cylinders up a notch, and then that tells us the, the result that we get as we move those variables. Um, so that's kind of the intuition behind multiple regression. The tricky part about this is that you cannot just draw a line for this. There are way too many moving parts. We had, that's just four different coefficients that we're dealing with. Um, there's no way you can do it. I have seen people do like a 3D scatter plot if there are two, ca or two continuous variables. Um, and so like on the Z axis, you'll, or on the, so the Y axis, you'll have displacement. Um, the X, you'll have displacement. Y, you'll have um, miles per gallon and Z you'll have cylinders, and so you can actually rotate this plot and see the line in 3D space. It looks cool, but it's really hard to interpret if you're dealing with 3D stuff. Plus, once you add another variable, you're in four dimensions, and I don't even know how that works. So you can't visualize these things just with a line. Um, so there are a few problems with trying to do this. Um, one problem is that every coefficient in that table Every slope that we care about, every effect, has its own estimate and its own standard errors. When we just do a regular scatter plot with two variables, we can draw that line, and that shaded area around the line shows the standard error. It shows that it could be a little bit higher, it could be a little bit, little bit lower. It's somewhere in that range. Um, with multiple regression, every single slope has its own range of errors, and you can't show all of those at once. So the solution is, instead of trying to draw a scatter plot, you plot all of the coefficients and all of their errors at the same time in something called a coefficient plot. And I'll show you an example of this in a minute. 
Um, and this is actually a really quick way of looking at the, the size of your different variable or your different coefficients to see which ones are big, which ones are small, which ones are statistically significant, meaning they're definitely not zero, um, versus which ones might be zero and be insignificant. Um, so that's one solution to this. The other issue is that there's way too many moving parts. Um, the results change every time you move one of these sliders or switches. If you're just dealing with two variables, that's a single slider. You're just saying as displacement goes up, um, miles per gallon does something. And that's the one slider you have to worry about. But once you have multiple variables, then you have to say as displacement goes up in rear wheel drive cars versus front wheel drive cars, and as you're moving these other um, the number of cylinders and other things, you can't do that with a single line anymore. And so a solution here is to plot something called the marginal effects um, for the coefficients that you're interested in, and you hold everything else constant. And this is essentially the graphical version of the slider analogy that we've been talking about and the switch analogy we've been talking about, where you hold all of the other variables constant and you tinker with one of the variables. So you, you use the average level of cylinders, you use the average type of drive, and you only move displacement up and down. And you show the plot of what miles per gallon does as you move displacement while holding every all the other switches and sliders the same. So we'll show some examples of this and how you actually do this with R. So for a coefficient plot, the way you do this is you run your model like normal. So we're going to make a model call, called car model big where it's highway miles per gallon is explained by displacement and cylinders and drive, and that's from our MPG data set. And then we're going to convert it into a data frame using tidy. And because it's a data frame, we can actually omit rows. We can do all of our fun dplyr things like filter and mutate and group by and summarize. And what we're going to do is remove our intercept term. Um, if you remember, the intercept was something like 30. Um, we don't generally care about the intercept when we're dealing with multiple regression, mostly because it's there so it can mathematically allow for slopes um, because you have to draw a whole bunch of different lines and you need an intercept for a line, but we don't actually really interpret that. If we wanted to interpret it, it would mean that would be the miles per gallon if you had a car with zero displacement, with zero cylinders, and that was uh, four-wheel drive, where all of these other coefficients are zero, which there is no car with no displacement and no cylinders, so it's not really a logical value. So we can get rid of it. Um, so what that leaves us with is this table here with four coefficients, the coefficient for displacement, for cylinders, and for the two types of drives. And because it's a data set, we can plot it. We can do stuff with it. So what we're going to do is take that car coefficients uh, data set. We're going to map the estimate to the x-axis. We're going to map the term or the name of the coefficient to the y-axis, and we'll use geom point range um, to show the, 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 the confidence intervals. And so the minimum value in the point range is going to be the 95% confidence interval at the low end, and the maximum of the interval is going to be the confidence interval at the high end. Um, and then to, show, to help show statistical significance, we use this new geom here called geom v-line, which stands for geom vertical line. And we'll put it at zero um, because that's where there's no effect. If the slope of a line is zero, it means nothing. It has no effect on, on your outcome. And we'll just make it red. And so it creates a plot that looks like this. We can see that cylinders and displacement have a negative effect on miles per gallon. They're both statistically significant because their errors here are not crossing zero. And so there's a pretty good chance that it, they're not zero. Um, and over here in the, the front wheel drive and the rear wheel drive coefficients, those are definitely positive. And so you can see the actual size of the coefficients here without digging through a table to figure out what the coefficients are. And so then you can say, oh, front wheel drive has a strong positive effect on miles per gallon compared to four, or rear, four wheel drive, which is the missing one here. Or cylinders, as that goes up, then your um, miles per gallon is going to go down. And you can see that in this coefficient plot. Um, these are becoming more and more popular in published research. Um, often you'll see academic articles and think tank articles and policy papers that will have a coefficient plot in the main text of the paper. And then in the appendix, they'll have a full table with the actual numbers and all of the, the standard errors and everything like very, very detailed in a giant table that you can then go refer to later. But for the most part, this is all people really need to know is how big is the coefficient? How far away is it from zero? 
um, how big are those errors. You can get all of that information from the coefficient plot. So that's one way to look at multiple regression is just uh, look at all the different coefficients. Um, another way to look at the effects of multiple regression models is to do something called a marginal effects plot. And so this again goes back to our analogy of the sliders and switches. Um, when we're interpreting those individual coefficients, we're leaving all the others constant. So we set the cylinder switch to, or slider to whatever the average number of cylinders is, and then we can manipulate one of the other variables. And so the same principle applies to visualizing the effect. Um, so what we do is we create a new data set and we plug in a whole bunch of numbers from that data set into our model to get predicted values of miles per gallon and then we plot those. So let's walk through an example of this. And so we create a data frame of values that we want to manipulate. It has to include all of the variables that are in the model. So for example, um, here we're going to create a new data set using the tibble function, which just creates a data frame. It's going to have three variables in it because we have three variables in our model. We're using displacement, cylinders, and drive. So displacement, we're going to use the sequence function where it's going to make a sequence of numbers from 2 to 7, skipping up by 0.1 every time. So it's going to be 2, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, etc., all the way up to 7. For our cylinders column, we're just going to use the average number of cylinders, whatever that is in the data. And for drive, we're just going to say this is a front wheel drive car, and we're going to hold that constant. And so we're using the sliders and switches here, but we're keeping them at a single level. Um, and so what that creates is this small data set, or this data set here. And so you can see we have one row that's two, a displacement of two um, with the average number of cylinders and front wheel drive. And then we have 2.1 with the same cylinders and the same drive, and 2.2 with the same cylinders and same drive. And that continues all the way down to seven. And so we have a whole bunch of different values here. What we can do is if we plug in each of those things into our equation, we can then figure out the predicted highway miles per gallon. So we could either do that by hand, and that would be miserable because there's like 60 rows there, or there's a function called augment that comes in the broom package that will plug in a data set into the model and calculate the predicted outcome. So here we're taking that big model and then we're going to take that new data set that we made um, and we're going to plug it in. And what that creates is a new data set here with, again, our original columns that we had here, displacement going from 2 to 7, cylinders held at its average, and drive for front wheel drive. And then we have a new column called dot fitted here. They put a dot at the front because, I don't know, they just did. Um, and this is the predicted highway miles per gallon if a car has a displacement of two, that many cylinders, and is front wheel drive. We could get that same number if we manually plug these things into the equation and multiplied and added everything, but R does that for us. And so there's our 27.3. And you can see that as we move displacement up, our fitted value is going to start shrinking. Now it's 27.2, 27.1, 26.9, etc. So that's going down. And for every one of those values, we have a standard error. Um, we have a range um, around that point, and so we can use that standard error to calculate a confidence interval, and we can see how accurate our prediction is. So now that this is a data frame with a fitted column, we can actually plot this. If we put displacement on the x-axis and fit it on the y-axis, um, we can just draw a line. And then that will show the effect of moving the displacement switch or slider up, and it'll show what happens to miles per gallon. So that's what this looks like. Um, this is the line. It just, as you move displacement up, the fitted miles per gallon goes down. Um, it also has a new geom here called geom ribbon. Um, which is this shaded area behind here. And so with geom ribbon, you have to feed it two aesthetics. You have to give it a minimum and a maximum. So that shows um, kind of the extent of the, of the ribbon. And so to, to, to add the 95% confidence intervals here, what we do is we take that fitted value and then we multiply the standard error times negative 1.96. And if you remember from your stats days, that's the way you get like the 2.5 percentile and the 97.5 percentile. So you can get a 95% confidence interval around your line. So that, that's what we're doing here. We're just adding the confidence interval above and below our line. And so then that gives us um, kind of a good visualization of the errors. 
Um, because of the nature of the data, the errors are a lot smaller down here in the displacement is three and four land. They're really wide out here and where displacement is seven, and that's because there aren't a lot of points in the original data that had a displacement of seven. And so it's doing lots of extrapolating here, and so it can't really be very precise. But up here, it's fairly precise. Um, but this shows the effect of moving that one variable, holding everything else constant. So you have to say, either in a footnote or in a caption in the plot, that all other variables are held at their mean, and that this is a front-wheel drive car. Um, but if you maintain all those other things, this is the effect of moving just one thing, which is really cool. Another thing we can do is we can actually move multiple sliders and switches at the same time. Um, and so, for instance, what is the marginal effect of increasing displacement for all three different types of cars um, with front and rear and four-wheel drive cars? So here, what we're going to do is we're still going to move our displacement, but we're going to move displacement from 2 to 7 for front-wheel drive cars. And then we're going to move the displacement from 2 to 7 for rear-wheel rear drive cars, and then do the same thing for four-wheel drive cars. Um, and we can do all of that at the same time using our functions, and we can plot all three of those at the same time. So to do this, we'll go through the same process. We have to create a new data set that varies displacement and it varies drive and will hold cylinders at, at its average level. Instead of using the tibble function to create a data, a data set, we're going to use the expand grid function, which creates a data set, but it creates a data set using every combination of what you feed it. So what this looks like is um, we still have our sequence from 2 to 7 by every 0.1, so 2, 2.1, 2.2, 2, 2 2.3. Um, we still have our average cylinders. But if you look here, now we're saying use three different drives. So expand grid, what it's going to do is it's going to find every combination of these things. And so it's going to have displacement of two for front, displacement of two for rear, displacement of two for four, displacement of 2.1 for front and rear and four, displacement of 2.2 for front and rear and four, et cetera. Um, and so you end up with something like this. So here's our displacement of two, average cylinders, front wheel drive. Here's our displacement of two, average cylinders, rear. And displacement of two, average cylinders, four wheel drive. All the way down the whole range of displacement. Um, and if we plug that new data set into our model, it will do all of the math for us and figure out predicted miles per gallon for each of the um, levels of displacement and the types of drives. And then we can use this data set to make a plot. And now that we have this varying drive column, we can actually map drive as another aesthetic onto our plot. We can fill by drive, or we can color by drive, or we can facet by drive. Um, we can do other things um, to show the effect of displacement, but across these different types of drives. So here's one example. Um, this is cylinders are held at their mean, but we're also varying displacement and we're varying drive. And so four-wheel drive, on average, gets a lot lower miles per gallon than the, than the other two. Front and rear-wheel drive are fairly indistinguishable. Um, they're right on top of each other. The effect as you change displacement is basically the same for both. Um, there's some overplotting here. This is kind of hard to see. And so what we can do is instead of just coloring and filling, we can also facet. And so now we have three different subplots for each of our um, drive types. And we can see that you can change displacement across all of those drive types. So here we're showing the effects of our regression using multiple sliders and switches um, in a single plot, which is like super magical. Um, and this is, this is once you get the hang of the process of um, creating a new data set with the things that you want to hold constant and the things you want to manipulate, plugging that into the model and then showing the fitted values. Once you get into that, that habit and figure out the process, it's really easy to do that for pretty much any model that you make. And this is not just for regular, ordinary least squares regression. Um, these coefficient plots and the fitted uh, marginal plots work for pretty much any model that R can do. Um, so if you're doing logistic regression or probit regression or ordered logit or multinomial regression or any of those fancy regression models that you learned in your stats classes, they all have coefficients. And so you can make a coefficient plot for them. Um, they all create predictions. And so you can make marginal effects plots for them. You can do multi-level modeling um, where you have fixed effects and random effects. Um, you can make the same plots for those. 
You can do cool plots with Bayesian models um, because those also have coefficients and effects. They also have uh, distributions associated with each of the coefficients. And so you can get all sorts of like cool mini density plots for each of your coefficients instead of just like the geom point range, you can have like a mini density plot. Um, and you can do all sorts of cool things. There's a whole package called Tidy Bays that provides a whole bunch of new geoms um, for ggplot that let you look at cool Bayesian things. Um, even machine learning models, um, like random forests and neural networks and stuff, you can plot those. You can plot their predictions um, and look at the marginal effects of different things, and you can plot their coefficients if they provide them. Um, so basically, if the model has coefficients and or if it makes predictions, you can visualize it, um, either using a coefficient plot or those marginal effects plots. And so you're not limited to just having a scatter plot with two variables. You can do all sorts of other variables mapped onto there to show all sorts of relationships. Um, and so your the example for today and um, your assignment for today will help you get practice with this. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to do this in the future. And it'll be exciting communicating multiple regression results to the general public. So good luck.